Welcome to the NCCWSC Climate Change Science and Management webinar series. Today we are joined by Ryan Boyles. Ryan is a director and state climatologist of the North Carolina State Climate Office, as well as the university director of the DOI at Southeast Climate Science Center at North Carolina State University. He is an applied climatologist interested in how the physical climate system impacts and interacts with other natural and human systems. He tends to look at more localized spatial scales, focusing on North Carolina and the southeastern United States. His research focuses on climate modeling, sensitivities of climate to other sectors, climate monitoring, monitoring and observation systems, and development of sector-specific climate education and decision support tools. He received his MS and PhD in Atmospheric Science from North Carolina State University and is here to talk today to talk about, the visual, about visualizing the impact of future climate on pine forest. Ryan? Uh, myself, uh, Heather, and Corey, are, are the co-authors on this, are the token climatologists. And of course, every project needs a token climatologist. I think every project should have a token climatologist. There's a big extension and public education component on this, and that's where a lot of our emphasis is going in terms of how we think about visualizing and conveying climate information to uh, a set of users. In particular, we've narrowed this down and we've said we're not necessarily going to try and reach out to all of the landowners in the southeast where uh, southern pine is, is largely held in private land, but they are increasingly relying on professional foresters, consulting foresters uh, to, to give them guidance and for managing the land for pine productivity, whether it's on an established formal plantation or if it's an informal uh, um, uh, pine management zone that isn't necessarily a heavily managed plantation, but is largely there managed for developing and growing loblolly pine. So if we think about the types of questions that a common audience would have, we see similar types of issues when we think about pine map. Now in particular, they had longer term climate model needs that were pretty specific. They wanted a sufficiently high resolution. Approximately the HUC-12 uh, spatial resolution is what they think of. And some of that is because of the nature of the variability that they see in pine productivity across the southeast. We have highly variable soils across the southeastern U.S. Um, we have a complex topography, certainly not what you would see in the western U.S., but fairly complex topography. And in, and in particular, we have a complex coastline that uh, plays some interesting things with precipitation patterns. We also have a lot of hazards that we're dealing with in terms of fire risk, pest risk, and um, high wind from tropical storm risk. One of the other requirements where they need continuous projections from now out through 2100, as well as historical periods that we could use to, to calibrate and, and use as baselines. In addition to precipitation and temperature, which is commonly used looking at these uh, downscale projections and, and used for decision models, they also needed incoming radiation and humidity because a lot of the forest productivity models required that for doing vapor, vapor pressure deficit and actually growing the, the, the trees. Our solution for this was to use a product out of the University of Idaho, John Abbas of Blue, uh, what he calls MACA. Um, there are a couple of versions of it out there, um, but MACA is a multivariate adapted constructed analog. They, they identify constructed analogs across the continental U.S. and then go through and use those to, to downscale from global climate projections to local scale climate projections. Now in this talk today, I don't have a whole lot of time to go into downscaling and the value of downscaling, all the different approaches in downscaling. That's probably a, a talk for another time. Um, and many of you have seen similar talks from, from uh, myself or, or my colleagues on that type. But MACA is the only product out there right now that gives us um, all of these different um, uh, requirements that we had. Um, and it's been supported by the Department of Interior's Climate Science Centers. It uses the latest CMIP 5 based um, global climate models and uses statistical process so we can efficiently get down to about a six kilometer resolution using 20 global climate models. So what this gives us is a, a, a real spread of, of climate models that helps us to assess what the range of future climates can be and gives us a sense of where the confidence is as well as the baseline periods that we need to assess what the uncertainties are. Now we go back to those earlier questions of uh, when we typically interact with a climate. Now we're interacting with clients, they're foresters. But we see similar types of questions. Now they're, they're thinking about how can we use climate projections for our civic cultural practices to, to look at our economic scenarios. How do we look at our, our, our productivity models? And they have to be consistent across the entire, um, uh, the entire project, which again is, is you know, upwards of, of 100 people, 40 PIs. Um, there's a lot of folks involved and it has to be consistent. That's been one of the challenges because everyone has slightly different needs. So we had to do some compromises. But the types of questions they, they, we've come across sound very familiar. Um, just give us output from the best model because I don't, I don't really have time to use all these others. 
uh, why do I have to use all the GCMs? Why can't I just use one? Why can't I just use the best one? Um, just give me the multi-model ensemble average. I don't have time to run through all the different models. Or it's too much data. My model, use, it runs in Excel. I, I can't possibly deal with all the data that you're going to throw at me. Um, or I just need, I have a few plots from a, a few dozen or a couple hundred locations across the southern U.S. Just give me those locations. So for different applications, for different designs, whether you're running um, something uh, uh, like WASI, which is run by the Forest Service as a water supply stress index that runs specifically at the HUC-12 level, or you're looking at individual plots, you need some sort of projection for that that's a flexible and useful for all of them. So by using some of this, we've been able to, to jump ahead and think about, okay, this is how we might utilize this data, this is how we might set up an infrastructure. But for the public use, for those professional foresters that are going to be visualizing not only the climate projections, but also all of the other output from all of the forest productivity models that are utilizing those climate projections, how are we going to convey to them not only um, likely scenarios, but the full range of future climates? Now, there are lots of resources out there. Um, if you want to just get the data, there are lots of great ones. There's a tremendous number of federal resources out there that provide access to the data. The USGS Geodata Portal is one that's, that's widely used as well. But all of these are really designed for scientists, professional users who know how to manipulate data, who understand things like net CDF formats and, and, and open DAP calls and thread services. But there's only really one solid resource that's widely used for visualizing this in such a way that it's easy, and that is the Climate Wizard. And Climate Wizard is great. It makes a lot of this data accessible, but it has some real limitations. You can only look at one scenario at a time, and you don't really capture the full range of scenarios. So it shows you one emission scenario. It shows you one general circulation model or an ensemble average. But it doesn't allow you to really look at the range of future solutions, and that's been a real requirement for us. So when we think about the requirements for our stakeholders, for professional foresters, one of the things that, that uh, coming in as a climatologist that I really want to emphasize is that there's not a single climate forecast. There's a range of future climates that are available, and we really want folks to understand where the range of future climate opportunities are as well as future climate risks. So one of our requirements was we had to have a, a range, and it had to be web-enabled. We wanted to be able to deliver this over web and not have to have software that people had to download um, that would be static. We have a lot of different derived variables that are, that are involved. There's a lot of different metrics, there's a lot of different decision models. And we want to have something that is fairly simple that conveys this range. And we've actually gone through three large, complete re, re, redesigns and iterations of this based on beta testing feedback. And what we found is that if you wanted to go to a single location, if you wanted to zoom into Mobile, Alabama, and see a projection, that we can do that very easy. We can manipulate the data and show the range on the fly. When we started talking about spatial products, map products, that show you spatially how the climate solutions for the future are going to vary, that's when things started getting tricky. What we implemented on the back end, for those of you who are interested in the back end, we have um, an open source thread service, which is a gridded data server that supports a lot of the OpenGIS standards and allows for us as programmers, but other users who want to go in, to extract out time series for points as well as to do grid, sub grid subsetting. We built a front end map interface using open layers, PHP and JavaScript. And we've gone through and pre-processed a lot of the derived variables that, we, that our beta testers have asked for and that a lot of the researchers have said that they, they think needs to be included. Now, this allows us to render the maps very fast, but it does limit the flexibility. And I'm going to give you a flavor for this. I'm going to go live here. I'm going to do a live demonstration, which, of course, is always dangerous when you're trying to do this over a webinar. But I'll flip over. I'm just running a uh, – <clears throat> uh, I'm running uh, Firefox. It also works well in Chrome. It even works in Internet Explorer and, uh, of course, uh, Safari. And this is the main uh, page, the URL at the top. This is public for anyone. It's climate.ncsu.edu slash map. And this is, I'm going to give you the flavor for what it looks like. And the general front page here just gives you some background information about um, what PineMap is, about the DSS tools, the different climate data sets that are available, um, the historical data, where it comes from, um, how to interpret the, the three map layout and the time series. And I'm going to go straight into that because this is where it gets, it gets a lot of fun. So what I'm going to start with here is a, a tool that was specifically designed looking at extreme minimum temperature. In this case, we're looking at the frequency, the number of days in which extreme minimum temperatures occur. In this case, you, we've got showing uh, 32 degrees, but we can go all the way down to, let's say, 25 degrees. And hopefully on your screen is rendering just as quickly as it is on mine. You have um, across the top um, the map display. You can right now, we're looking at the historical average, the, the average number of days, as well as the, sort of the range of the historical. In, case, in this case, the historical average um, we're using is 1986 to 2005. Of course, we have data that goes back much further. Um, but for pine production, uh, only what's happened really uh, in the past 
approximately uh, 20 to 25 years is relevant because pine management practices has have really changed a lot. For a water resource manager, it might be a much longer record. For um, a shorter term crop, it may be a much shorter, uh, shorter record. But for at least pine productivity in the southern U.S., um, that seemed to be a good period. And it gave us a long enough period that we felt like we were capturing the range of climate variability over this, over this period. Other across the top, you have a projected change. I'll show that in a second. And a projected average. And what you have across is a, is a three map layout. And this is universal to a lot of the, the, the visualization here is these three maps where the historical average or the multi-model mean, if we're looking at projections, is going to be in the middle. Then you have a range. You have a low end and a high end. In this case, you have an average, a low, minus two standard deviations as the low side, and plus two standard deviations in terms of that background variability. But we can go and we can, uh, we can pick a location. I'm going to uh, be selfish and choose uh, approximately the Raleigh area. You click on the map, it will load the details for that location. In this case, we're looking at an area in Lee County, which is uh, a few miles south of Raleigh. And what you have here across the top are the, are the values. Well, historically, on average, we have in this area 30.5 days where temperatures get below 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, that ranges from year to year. On the lowest typically observed, we might see only nine days, 8.9 days. On the high end, we might see 50 days. Now, the other thing you can do is click on one of the other maps on the side, and it'll show you. You can also, of course, zoom in like you will on any map and zoom into any specific area. If you wanted, you could really zoom in close and show the individual counties. You're not sure which county you're in. You might want to look at a, a, another county. Or if you don't like want to deal with counties, you can go up here and insert the latitude and longitude. But this three-map layout allows changes in one to be reflected in changes for the other. So all we have to do is click on one map. We can zoom in, move it around. The other three maps move around so that at any given time, we can see consistently what the range of future climates have been, and then, of course, then look at what the range of future climates will be. So for the same location, let's change the map at the top, and we're going to go to projected change. Down below, in one of the things down below that we want to highlight again for this location, there is a bar chart that sort of shows what the range of future climates are going to be for this location. So these averages, as well as these things into the future, are the um, changes under different climate scenarios. So you have the lighter gray, which is uh, the RCP uh, 4.5, if you're familiar with uh, RCP scenarios. The darker gray is the higher emissions RCP 8.5. And you can see how for this location, here's the background observed, as well as the projections are into the future. And so you can see the differences. But it's not just a, a single projection for the future. It's a range. You have a multi-model average, as well as a range of possible changes into the future. <clears throat> so let's go to a different uh, tool. Let's try the summer temperature tool. So instead of looking now at number of days with temperature, we might look at what the historical average is in uh, the average temperatures for the summer doing. Now, this is important for pine productivity. Warmer conditions lead to more productivity, more production. <clears throat> and here's the historical average that you see here, and we'll again find a location. In this case, I'll, I'll choose, a, uh, let's place some, choose some place in central Tennessee. The historical average summertime temperature is 76 degrees on average, but you see there's a bit of a range there. You have cool summers where it's closer to 74 is the average, warm summers where it's closer to 79. And as we scroll down, we'll be able to see for this location, here is the average and then how those projections are expected to increase. Now, these gray bars here cover a range of future climates. And it doesn't mean that um, any one of those is, is, is guaranteed, certainly, but it, it, it helps the user understand where the risk is. What's the range of possible future climates? Now, up back to our map product. Instead of looking at just the historical observed, we're going to try and switch it, again, the projected change and projected average. But now you can see here's the multi-model average that showed for, historic, uh, for projected summer temperature. And at the top of here, we're now we're just looking at the future time of 2020 to 2039. Let's go mid-century, 2060 to 2079. We want to show to users that it's not just um, what's going to happen in any single year. So you have to take the climate model projections and average them into at least 20-year blocks. We prefer 30-year blocks. But at least for our choices, we felt it had to be at least 20 years. And so you can see that towards the end of the century, under this emission scenario, again, this is the high emission scenario, RCP 8.5, that we're seeing an increase of central, in central Tennessee on the order of about 8.2 degrees, but that that's not the only solution. That actually could be quite a bit less or could be quite a bit more, even under 
this emission scenario. But we can scroll down and see that what's shown on the map right here is quite a bit of a range. The average might be um, a, an increase of five degrees under RCP 4.5 or eight degrees under RCP 8.5. But you can see that over time how this is likely to change. There's a couple things here that shows you. There's a little more spread in the models under RCP 8.5. Those higher emission scenarios have a little more um, a spread in the model solutions than RCP 4.5. But it also shows you that as you get out towards the end of the century in particular, there's a big difference in how we as humans um, uh, are, are going to deal with uh, greenhouse gas management. And there's a big difference in what we expect towards the end of the century under RCP 8.5 than RCP 4.5. So we've done this so far for a variety of temperature data. We've also are looking at some drought indices. Um, we've done some projection tools. I'll show you one more example after I do this one. Here's a precipitation. Again, summertime precipitation, the prime growth period for southern pine. Here's the historical. Let's go in and choose the projected range here. Again, let's, uh, this is 2020 to 2039. I'll change that. We'll go out towards end of century to get dramatic. And what you see is that there's quite a bit of model spread here. On the low side, we'll, we'll pick a location. Um, for pine trees, we care a lot about what's, um, what's happening in eastern Texas because that's right on the fringe. Um, and you could be a little bit drier. You could be a lot drier. On the uh, lower side, you could be five inches drier in the summertime, which is losing a month of summer, basically. Or on the high side, you could be a little bit wetter. Scroll down a little bit, and you can see the spread that's included in there. Now, with precipitation, the changes aren't nearly as dramatic in some cases as there are in the temperature. Or I should say that the, the model confidence in it is not nearly there. There's quite a bit of spread and a lot of uncertainty as to what might happen, but it helps to get, let users get a sense as to where the high-risk areas are and where the low-risk areas are. For example, if you're looking at growing in uh, North Carolina or Virginia, the risk isn't nearly as great. It tends to be, fall more on the wet side than it does on the dry side. One other tool I'll go and show you how this data can be uh, transformed into some other more uh, complicated tools is what we're talking a seedling market tool. This is based on extreme minimum temperature that's observed every year. You can think about it like the plant hardiness zones. So we'll click a location, and this is to choose um, to set what the location of interest is. And from there, we'll then see, okay, from where can we take current seedling and market it into the future? So as climate is going to change, minimum temperatures, the number of days that it gets extremely cold and the extreme cold minimum temperature is going to migrate further north. So seedlings that we're looking at now will be able to migrate into, uh, that are currently grown in central Alabama, you know, by the end of the century might be viable as you move into Kentucky and into um, other areas. So another area is uh, looking at, for example, there's a lot of seedlings that are pulled out of parts of eastern South Carolina because they're very robust, that those same seedlings that um, right now do very well in South Carolina, by um, the end of the century, as we look up here, will be viable into Tennessee and to Kentucky. Um, this is how we're trying to think about not just the, the, the negative impacts of climate change that folks are thinking about, but also the opportunities for folks to take advantage of. If you uh, know that you're going to be able to, it's going to be warmer, you can start thinking about where your generation of, of seedlings that are growing now can be marketed to be more productive in the next 20 to 60 years. Um, so uh, with that, I will switch back over to PowerPoint and finish up with the last few slides before we go into questions. So, where are we going in terms of future projection? All I'm showing you is just the climate data. But we have a lot of other modeling output that's coming from the WASI model, which is the Water Supply Stress Index that's used by Forest Service. Uh, 3PG is an actual uh, productivity model that's used to, to um, look at that, uh, look at pine productivity, and then uh, the growth and yield models that have been historically used. And all of that output is going to be coming in, and we're looking at ways to visualize that along that similar three map layout to show how a green weight index is going to change, how um, evapotranspiration is going to change, how some of these other things are going to change. We also have a lot of fact sheets that are in development uh, that's behind the background of this data and these models so that the users that are visualizing and seeing the data understand some of the science that goes into it. And then, of course, with any process, there's a lot of training and user engagement. We've already started doing this, um, reaching out to the Society of American Foresters and going to some of the regional meetings. But it really is emphasized, at least for this, on just the south, um, southern U.S., the pine production region. But as you can imagine, um, this, we, we think that there's a lot of application for this type of a visualization and with some tweaks, I think, to a lot of other audiences. And we can look at a lot of other climate variables. We can look at, look at a lot of other output um, to try and convey where future climates might evolve and help people convey those. And so I'm actively looking for guidance now from, from the LCCs and the other climate science centers 
And what are the kind of variables they want to see that would be important to their audiences? We can very easily take this code base and port it, change it, brand it, make it look like uh, something that's going to be intuitive and useful to other resource managers that are out there. Things that we already have planned, for example, are a seasonal and annual average temperature and precipitation changes. Uh, uh, extreme events like days with temperatures that, that go above 95 growing season length and evapotranspiration, as well as drought severity and frequency. That's something I'm particularly interested in when we think about ecological drought impacts. How do we think about drought uh, in the future uh, and its impacts to ecosystems? Uh, we have projections. We have um, good historical data. We have a lot more we can do, and we have oh, this wonderful framework that Corey and Heather have put so much time into that we think is a, is a compelling way to visualize this in the future. But we're still exploring. Um, for example, last week we were doing an eye tracking study with a bunch of professional foresters to see how do they interact with this three map layout? Does it make sense? Is it intuitive? Um, simple things like colors and titles, do they actually look at them? Do the colors that, that we've used through our beta testing process with professional foresters, is that fairly universal or is it really just um, based on the limited number of beta testers that we've had already? Um, and we're thinking about what audiences does it work for and what, for what audiences does this not work for? So we think there's a lot of potential uh, future use of this. We think it can pay, com it's a more compelling way of thinking about the layout, the, the, the range of future climates that are available. Um, and we ho we're hopeful that this will allow for stakeholders and users that are thinking about climate, that are asking the climate question and how it impacts um, their resource that they're trying to manage. How do they go beyond thinking about just a single multi-model average and the solution for what climate change is going to be and think about what the range of future climates could be because we think that's going to allow for a more resilient decisions. And then, of course, I need to recognize all the folks that help support this. Uh, the bulk of the money comes under the Pine Map Award. Uh, we're a subcontractor uh, on the Prime Award from University of Florida. Tim Martin there is the PI. Um, there was support to John Abbasoglu uh, uh, from uh, both the Southeast Climate Science Center and the Northwest Climate Science Center, supported under Department of Interior. Um, and we've got a lot of feedback from beta testers and a lot of pine mat researchers. What, you, what, what I showed today was released back in December, um, but we've been working on it off and on through three generations of it for about four years now. And then, of course, a tremendous amount of technical support came from John Abbasoglu and his postdoc. Um, Catherine Hedgewitch up at the University of Idaho. Uh, many thanks to them for long hours on the phone helping us to understand and manipulate this data. Uh, so with that, I'll, um, that's the end of the formal presentation. We'll turn it over to uh, uh, questions now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, like you said, we'll be turning it over to questions. Okay, it looks like we got our first question. Uh, it's from Jennifer Hushaw. I hope I said that right. Uh, have the foresters who have beta tested the tool indicated how they see themselves using the info uh, as an input to planning, growth modeling, et cetera? The ones that we've interacted with so far, um, are uh, a lot of their decisions are going to come from the other productivity model output that comes in. From the climate stuff just alone, they're looking at um, the, the primary factors is cold tolerance. Um, the other one is uh, precipitation. And, and so folks in Eastern Texas are concerned, okay, how much longer are we going to be able to potentially grow loblolly pine with current genetics um, in, in, in this part of Eastern Texas where you're already at the fringe? The other is the, the cold tolerance. So looking at um, what zones are going to be most appropriate. In general, if you pull, um, uh, pull genetics, you pull seedlings that, are, that typically grow natively further south and bring those north, you get more productivity out of it. So you're trying to balance cold risk from extreme cold temperatures with productivity. And that's where the, the balance is. And everyone sort of has their own sort of risk profile as to how risky they're willing to be. And so someplace in central North Carolina, you know, they might feel comfortable pulling right now from um, the, the border with South Carolina to grow seedlings because the cold tolerance isn't that different, but they might get a little more productivity. The trees may grow faster. But they might not um, right now um, pull from, say, uh, um, Savannah area. But under climate change, if these trees are going to be in the ground for the next 30 years and they're looking at a 25 to 30 year rotation, then they may say, okay, we're not looking at as much cold tolerance. So if I pull from tree seedlings that, that currently grow in the savanna area, I'm going to get that much more productivity. So it may be worthwhile to go a little bit further south and bring up a, a, a variety that is more productive uh, and bring it into my area because um, I'm not as concerned about uh, cold risk. Okay. Uh, our next question is from Carrie. Uh, she asks, what is the timeline on future development, i.e., how long does PineMap funding last? Uh, PineMap just got a, a no-cost extension for one year. It will end February of 2017. Okay, great. 
And uh, oh. Mary Davis asks, can increased fire risk be predicted? Oh, this is a tough one, and it comes down to uh, drought as much as anything. And so one of the things we're trying to look at, and we're, we're working on right now on a, on a summer dryness index that is maybe a good indicator of, of drought. Um, and, but fire risk is, is very local, has a lot to do with, with other factors, how the land is managed, as well as what the weather conditions are. Drought impacts and drought risk can be forecasted. It's tougher to look at fire risk. Now, what we could do is take all the model projections that we have and run them through NFDRS, the National Fire Danger Rating System, to look at potential changes in things like fire and drought index or energy release components, some of those other things. But a lot of that comes down to more um, how is the, the, the pine plantation managed? Do they actively manage it and do they actively do controlled burns anyway? Because if they do, then that's really going to manage the, the, the real fire risk in the long term. The things we can't do right now is look at, um, with these data sets at least, is look at what the change in things like thunderstorm and lightning induced fire might be. We don't have the ability to do that yet. Okay. And um, could you tell us a bit about the seedling sources tool? It looks like a useful tool and I'm curious how it was done. Is this mostly based on forecasting of cold hardiness zone shifting? Uh, that question is from Christopher Warren. So yes, um, for the, there's a, a researcher uh, named Schmidling who has done some research who basically said within a five degree zone you can move seedlings around. So what we instead do is look at, okay, uh, we're going to take those extreme minimum temperatures which determine hardiness um, for, for loblolly pine and we're going to say how is that going to change in the coming century based on downscaled climate projections. So. Um, it's not just based on random. We're actually looking at the raw model output and then showing how that might change in the future. So there's two tools that we were using with the same data set. It's just a different way of conveying the information. The seedling sources would be, and you can click on the frequently asked tool up here if you want to see uh, more details on that. Um, if I wanted to grow in my current location, so in this interest I've chosen a location in Davidson County, Tennessee, and there's a latitude and longitude. For this location, if I wanted to grow trees more effectively, from where should I pull my seedling? What should be my seedling source? And so in this case, it tells you how far south you might want to pull depending on um, whether you're looking at a 20-year stand or all the way out to an 80-year stand. So if you're looking, for example, at an 80-year stand, which is pretty unusual for a pine production uh, under commercial standards, you might pull as far south as South Alabama. On a more typical 30 to 40 year stand, you're pulling with, with, with the same amount of cold tolerance, the same amount of cold risk, you could pull to however from Central Alabama fairly safely um, under these, but you see there's quite a bit of range. So that range, if you want to be less tolerant, you might only pull from Northern Alabama. If you're really risk tolerant and, 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 and want to get maximum productivity, you can see under this likely range for extreme minimum temperatures, you could pull even on a 20 to uh, to 30 to 40 year stand from central to southern Alabama. It's not that there's a single forecast for what the temperatures are going to be, it's truly a range of forecasts. And we're hoping that whether you're a nursery and you're trying to market your seedlings or you're a landowner or professional forester and you're looking to buy your seedlings, that you can actually take advantage of these climate projections uh, and the confidence we have in them to make better decisions and take advantage of the warming that's expected to reduce your cold risk. Okay, and um, do you know of any plans to develop similar visual, visualization tools in other regions of the country? This is coming from somebody in the Great Lakes. Well, our target area for professional foresters is the southeastern U.S. However, the data set is available for the entire continental U.S. So let's zoom into the Great Lakes. Now the colors are not going to show anything, it's all washed out because we wanted to show maximum color differences across the southeast. But we can still choose a single location and find out up, up, up here in, let's say, uh, Wisconsin, here's the historical number of days where temperatures drop below 32 and how that is, um, what that's been in history, and we can also look at what the projected changes are. So we can go out to uh, end of century very easily with those projected changes and we're looking at the multi-model average is about 68 fewer days, so two months less of temperatures below 32 in northern Wisconsin here. But that's a range here. It's not just a single. That's the multi-model average. But two standard deviations below, and looking at the model spread, is 30 fewer days, or on the high end, um, more than three months loss of, of winter, basically. And you can 
So we have the data and it can be visualized and adjusted uh, really for, for anywhere in the continental U.S. More important question I would think is, what are the metrics that are most important to the audiences up there? Is 32 a meaningful threshold to them? Um, yes, yeah, the point at which water freezes, but for vegetation or other pest dieback or for other ecosystem, it may be that there are other thresholds. And that's where we're actively looking for partners, research partners, as well as folks who really want to communicate this more effectively to stakeholders to help tell us what those thresholds are, help us understand the variables that are most important to their ecosystem. And then it is relatively simple to go through and reprocess that data and visualize it and hopefully what we, what we think is a fairly compelling way. Okay, well, uh, I'd like to thank Ryan for a great presentation. Uh, I think that was a really informative. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that participated in the chat.